Hello everybody, my name is Matt, I'm with Scope Education, and I'm really hoping that this recording goes well because I've had a couple issues uh, recording this. One of those issues was my cat drop kicking my microphone off my desk, so if that happens again, I swear I'm going to but regardless, let's get into some fun medicine. So in this one, we're going to be talking about implementing beta blockers and hemodynamic dosing of some epinephrine for our cardiac arrest patients. So what works for our cardiac arrest patients based off the literature? Early bystander CPR and defibrillation, high performance CPR, which is minimizing our hands off the chest time do not lean on the chest and giving about eight breaths per minute making sure that you aren't hyperventilating them especially after you get rosk but what else hemodynamic dosing of epinephrine is going to be one of the things we're going to be talking about in this lecture continuous aggressive management and monitoring of the patient in the icu and transporting them to a facility capable of this so don't send them to an urgent care please and finally, how epinephrine acts on the potassium and magnesium levels inside of her body. As we know, ACLS protocols tell us to utilize and give one milligram of epi every three to five minutes. People have noticed that you can obtain ROSC, but that doesn't increase the chances of leaving the hospital neurologically intact. Now, I bet you I could find a rock on the street and give it enough epinephrine and somehow produce a palpable pulse on it. But... Our whole point of doing CPR on these patients is to not just get ROS, but also allow them to walk out of the hospital and have a, a higher quality of life. So, we need to talk a little bit about epinephrine, and this is where we get a little nerdy, but don't you worry, it's going to get a lot nerdier. Epinephrine is a non-selective adrenergic agonist that acts on the alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. So, for those who do not know about adrenergic receptors, let me help you. Adrenergic receptors are very sensitive to epinephrine, also called adrenaline and norepinephrine. These receptors can be utilized by medications to increase blood pressure and cause bronchodilation. And I am created a nifty little chart that is not copyrighted because I made this so no one can sue me. You can see what all of them kind of do and where they're located. So basically epinephrine is that cool kid in high school who hangs out with everyone and every kind of group and no matter who they are. Epinephrine acts on all these adrenergic receptors. So what do we need to know about epinephrine in our cardiac arrest patients? Epinephrine's alpha effects are great for our patients in cardiac arrest, but when we get ROSC, the beta effects cause an increase in heart rate, which will increase our myocardial oxygen requirements. This is not ideal for a patient with a really mad heart. To get a better understanding of how these receptors work, we will go into the mechanism of action for each of these. So we're going to have to put on our nerd hats here. And by nerd hats, I mean we're going to have to probably search in our closet and find our extra nerd hat because we're going to go deep into this. Alpha-1 receptors have a, something called a GQ protein attached to them. As mentioned before, epinephrine and norepinephrine act on these. But just remember that epinephrine has a higher affinity than norepinephrine to adhere to these receptors. When the GQ protein is activated, it simulates phospholipase C. This breaks down into IP3 and DAG. These can cause an increase in calcium to leave the calcium storage centers inside of the cells. Calcium binds to a protein called calmodulin to make a calcium calmodulin complex. These can phosphorylate different proteins which can allow cations to leak into the cells and it also does several other functions. Now we're going to talk about our alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Luckily this is one is not as complex as our alpha-1. The alpha-2 adrenergic receptor is coupled with a GI or inhibitory protein that has three parts to it. It has the alpha inhibitory, the beta inhibitory, and the gamma inhibitory. The alpha inhibitory subunit separates from the beta slash gamma subunit. The alpha inhibitory protein binds to adenyl cyclase or AC and it inhibits it from working. The AC normally converts ATP to cycling AMP or CAMP. CAMP is used to activate protein kinase A or PKA. So those are the normal ones, but if the alpha inhibitory protein prevents the AC from converting ATP to CAMP, do you think that this will actually happen? Absolutely not. The beta and the gamma inhibitory subunits are binds onto the channel to open them up and allow positive potassium ion to leave, which makes a cell have a negative charge. This is significant because alpha-2 receptors are located on the presynaptic nerve terminals. And finally, we're going to go into the beta-adrenergic receptors. Luckily, 
they all do a similar process, so no need to stick that needle in your eye. This will get a little bit easier. When the adrenergic receptor is stimulated by epinephrine or norepi, it will activate a GS protein or G stimulatory protein. This protein will lose a GDP and gain a GTP, which activates the GS protein to act on adenyl cyclase, or AC as mentioned before. This will increase the amount of ATP being converted to CAMP, which increases the activation of PKA, which will phosphorylate the various proteins and enzymes, which can act on other receptors that can cause ions to shift into the cells. So what you're hearing is a lot of things flow into the cells, which is gonna be important for us to remember when we get to our later sections. So now that we have all the receptors figured out, let's get into how these affect the heart and why epinephrine is good and bad. So in our heart, there are alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors. Beta-1 is located on the SA node, AV node, bundle of His, and in the actual contractile cells of the myocardium. The beta-1 receptor, when activated, increases the action potential, which then causes an increase in heart rate, cardiac output, blood pressure, and stroke. Increasing the heart rate is not ideal in our sick heart patients as it increases the myocardial oxygen demand. So how are we going to fix these issues? Now, before we go into the slide, I'm going to do a little bit of a disclaimer here. Before someone starts yelling at me that the study uh, suggests we give a pure alpha-2 medication, I understand that, that that is their intention. It's going to be down in the description for you guys to look at. I am also a realist, and I know that changes in medicine happen in phases, and it occurs gradually over time as more literature arises. There is more support for administering beta blockers with epinephrine for our cardiac arrest patients than there is for giving a pure alpha-2 medication. I would like to see more research into comparing the two, so if there's a study out there that I haven't seen, please feel free to message me. But anyways, let's get back into the beta blocker administration. Plus, this helps tie in more of the electrolyte issues that we're going to be seeing when we give epinephrine. What has been mentioned several times in various literatures is to administer a beta blocker to cancel out the beta effects of epinephrine so we only get the positive alpha effects which will increase our coronary perfusion pressure and to only give epinephrine to patients who need it. What do I mean by this? A study was performed on domestic pigs where they administered both alpha-1 and beta adrenergic antagonists along with epinephrine. This study found that this cocktail had the same percentage of pigs who obtained ROSC when compared to the other two treatments, but also had a higher number of neurologically intact specimens in comparison to the other treatments. So basically, beta blockers plus alpha-1 antagonists plus epi equals same percent chance of obtaining ROSC and higher number of neurologically intact specimens. Now we're going to talk about hemodynamic dosing of epinephrine. We know that overloading our patients with epinephrine is a terrible idea which is why more studies suggest we give a maximum of like five doses of epinephrine during an arrest. And that's personally how we do it where I work. Now, what I love about medicine is that everyone is completely different in how they react to medications, and some people need less or more than others. There's this guy named Dr. Scott Weingart and, who made a podcast, and to be completely honest, if you haven't heard of him and you're listening to us, what are you doing with your life? I mean, honestly, like he is pristine level of genius. So he created this, he made this podcast, and I'll have that link down below, and it's super fascinating, and it all kind of makes sense. He suggests that we give epinephrine as needed, which is the hemodynamic dosing of epinephrine. This will lead to a decrease in the amount that we administer and we should only be administering it to patients who need it at that time. Studies have shown that obtaining a coronary perfusion pressure of 15 milligrams of mercury or greater gives providers the highest chance of obtaining ROSC. In the podcast I was referencing, they mentioned you need to get a central line and an arterial line to monitor the central venous pressure. If you work in the ICU, that's awesome. You might have one of these. If not, Dr. Weingart suggests obtaining an art line and aiming for a diastolic pressure of 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, the AHA actually is recommending providers to do this during resuscitation, but they say to aim for a blood diastolic blood pressure of 25 to 30. Dr. Weingart disagrees with these numbers and his reasoning is spot on. In a cardiac arrest, we have an equalization of arterial pressure and venous pressure. The high pressure will move to the low pressure in the venous system, so our central venous pressure will be higher in cardiac arrest patients. Another point is in our cardiac arrest patients, if they have a coronary lesion, they will need a higher diastolic arterial blood pressure which is why Dr. Scott Weingart recommends hitting a number which is higher, the 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury, opposed to what the AHA recommends. Now, you might think this is all dandy, but I'm pre-hospital, so how is this going to help me? I don't have art lines or anything like that. So, 
what do we have? We have entitled CO2. Whether you intubate a patient or you drop a supraglottic airway, we always should have entitled CO2 on our patient. And the golden number you need to look for on our entitled CO2 is 20 millimeters of mercury or higher. You had to say this to the other providers. We have to hit an entitle of 20. We can do that with either better CPR or I'm gonna give some epinephrine. So that's how we can do that in the field, and I think that's really interesting. One last thing on epinephrine, which I believe is important to hit on, when you give a lot of epinephrine, it can cause epinephrine toxicity and will cause pressure-dependent circulation. This is a fancy term, meaning the only reason you have ROSC is due to the crap ton of pressors you slammed into this patient, and when those pressors wear off, they will re-arrest. I am pretty sure anyone with more than six months of experience has experienced this several times. So how do we prevent them from doing this? We administer more pressors during ROSC and slowly wean the patient off of them until they can support their own blood pressure. Remember, the heart is really mad and it sometimes just needs to be coddled. Give us some epi, give us some push dose pressors or whatever presser agent you guys have and just, you know, baby it. And it's like, hey man, I, I got you. I'm going to help you, spoon feed you. Okay, you're running. You don't need me anymore. We're good now. And... This might not be able to be done in the pre-hospital setting where they can support their blood pressure on their own. This can usually be accomplished in the ICU as they have the patient for longer than us. So transport them to a place that can actually help these patients. Don't bring them to a dock in the box. Now we're going to talk about hypomag and hypokalemia. For those who do not know, there are several studies that have come out that show that a lot of epinephrine administration during a cardiac arrest can cause hypo-K and hypomag. Epinephrine has been seen to decrease the serum potassium by stimulating the beta-2 receptors causing an intracellular shift of potassium. Extreme hypokalemia can cause prominent U waves, which can be seen on an ECG, and I will show you an example of that after the slide. Prominent U waves can prolong the QU interval and increase the likelihood of the R on T occurring and sending your patients into torsades de poids or torsades de pointes, whichever one you want to call it, which is big and as the kids say nowadays, that is a large oof. And do you know what else can cause torsades? A prolonged QT interval over 500 milliseconds, which is what hypomag can cause. So what can we learn from this? Epinephrine causes shifts in our electrolytes, so giving less epinephrine is better. And because epinephrine acts on the beta-2 receptor to cause the hypokalemia, wouldn't that mean that the beta blocker that we administered to, to the patient would prevent this from happening? I believe so. So it probably wouldn't be such a bad idea to do a basic metabolic panel or BMP on your post-arrest patients, if possible. If you're hospital, I'm sure you're going to do it. If you're pre-hospital, it depends on how much your system actually wants to invest in them. And if you see any of these electrolyte issues, then you could easily give the required amount of medication to replenish them. And here is the thing showing hypokalemia. You can notice you have a prolonged QU interval. So this really big thing right here is a U wave, is a quote unquote kind of biphasic T wave looking thing. It, go, it has a down up morphology, down up morphology, down up morphology. Now this is totally different if you guys know anything about ECGs, when some people think of biphasic T waves of like the down up or whatever, they start thinking Wellens. So Wellens is up down morphology and hypokalemia is down up, so down up. If these were reversed and went up down, it, would, it might be well in, so just keep that in the back of your mind. And here's the conclusion. We have gotten better at resuscitating our patients. Maximizing our hands on chest time and early defibrillation is great for our patients. But because of the negative beta effects of epinephrine, such as increased myocardial oxygen demand and the electrolyte shifts, we should look more into administering a beta blocker in our cardiac arrest patients and if we don't want to do that, at least reducing the amount of epinephrine given by doing the hemodynamic dosing of epinephrine. I was also looking at our analytics on YouTube and I realized that less than 90% of people who watch our videos are actually subscribed to the channel. So if you guys want some cool medicine lectures and we'll only get better from here, feel free to subscribe or do whatever you want. Also, we have our own website. You guys check out scopeeducation.training. I'll have all those links in the description. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter because we don't just do YouTube. We also post we try to post weekly actual blog posts so my name is matt and i hope you guys enjoy this on domestic pigs where they administer both alpha <laughs> oh my god this this slide is gonna make me use some very colorful metaphors oh my gosh it won't end i have this really strange feeling that this slide and i are gonna become really good friends we're gonna spend a lot of time together so what's good with dr sky
did hit boom my god i was not ready to feel this much masochism today i'm just not ready for it i should have had a better breakfast